breaking the wall to computational expressivity in music performance. How an artificial intelligence can become a truly musical companion. Gerhard Widmer, Johannes Kepler University, Linz. On November the 9th, 1989, I was in Vienna, less than 50 kilometers away from the Iron Curtain, which had already begun to disintegrate in the weeks and months before. It was fantastically exciting for all of us. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us here. I mean, I'm standing here alone, but what you're going to see is the result of teamwork of a fantastic team over many years. And uh, let's see if this moves to the ne next slide. Um, four of my colleagues are here with me because the thing that we're going to demonstrate at the end is really their work. Uh, now, we are computer scientists. And so this is going to be a PowerPoint presentation again. Um, but this is about music. And I'm, I'm sure you all love music. Everybody does, don't they? Only bad people have no songs, as an old German saying goes. Uh, we have this beautiful piano here. So let's start with some piano music from the 19th century. A Nocturne by Frédéric Chopin. I'm sure many of you know the piece, so just sit back and listen. That's bad, isn't it? Terrible. That was awful. There was something dead wrong here, and of course you know what the problem was. What you just heard was a completely unexpressive mechanical rendition of the piece. Uh, all the notes with the same loudness, just perfectly constant tempo, just the, the notes precisely as they appear in the score the way a machine would play it. And indeed, this was played by a machine, our laptop over there that controlled this computer grand piano. Now, um, here's real music. Here's how a, a human pianist played the same passage on a particular evening in May 1989. was very different, wasn't it? This was living, breathing music. So mus obviously music is much, much more than what's written in the score. It's more than just notes with prescribed durations and pitches. Music needs the, the human touch of the performer to make it come alive and to make it expressive and to communicate emotions and moods. And they do that by adding subtle nuances that go beyond what's written in the score. We call this art expressive music performance, and it's really at the heart of the musical experience. This is what makes us go to concerts and listen to the same pieces over and over again. Or to put it in the words of one of the pioneers of performance research, Carl Seashore, the unlimited resources for vocal and instrumental art lie in artistic deviation from the pure, the exact, the perfect, the rigid, and the precise. And here, we, this is an example of these artistic deviations from the rigid and the precise. We have here the tempo and loudness fluctuations applied by a pianist over a few bars of Chopin. So, uh, unexpressed mechanical performance will give you two, two straight lines. Constant tempo, constant loudness. So, obviously, there's a lot going on here. And if you think this is random, here are four pianists, different pianists, and here are ten. So, obviously, there are very strong commonalities, but also lots of differences. And as scientists, we want to understand how this works. What is, what is the significance of these common patterns? How do they depend on the underlying music? And what's their function? And what about the differences? How do they relate, do they relate to personal style or just randomness? And how does all this contribute to communicating emotion and, and musical effect? These are big questions for various branches of science, musicology, psychology, the cognitive sciences. And our particular approach to this is computational, quantitative. We start from data, lots of data, and we build computer models and algorithms to try to shed a bit of light into some of these questions. And we've been doing so for quite some years. 
Um, for example, with respect to systematic differences, we demonstrated that computers can actually learn to distinguish between famous pianists solely based on the way they play. So there is something about artistic personal style that can clearly be detected and quantified. We've also shown that computers can learn to predict the specific emotions that human listeners will perceive when a piece is played in different ways. And we are beginning to see what it is in performances that seems to communicate these emotions. But the reason why you were here today is not the difference, it's, it's these striking similarities, these common patterns, which clearly show that there has, have got, got to be some rational, systematic aspects to this. Things that everybody seems to do, more or less. Things that maybe you have to do to make music sound musical and natural to us. And if that is so, if there are systematic underlying principles, then surely a machine should be able to discover and learn these from data and describe them to us. So the ultimate question for today is, can a machine and computer learn to play music expressively itself by analyzing human performances? And is that sufficient to give us music that would sound naturally expressive to us? And what would that tell us about music and our perception of it? So this is a machine learning scenario. We will present the computer with lots of example data, musical scores as written, and performances of these as played by musicians. And we will want it to learn general rules of performance, or more technically, to learn a model that can predict, given the score of an arbitrary piece, how this piece will likely be played or should be played. And it will not be enough to just predict such overall tempo and loudness curves, because uh, piano performance is much, much more subtle. It's really about the details of every single note. So we will need extremely precise training data, information about how each individual note was played by a pianist, how, when, how long, how loud. And we cannot measure, this is something we cannot measure from audio recordings at that level of precision. You have to take my word for it. So we, we cannot just, you know, collect all the recordings of the great pianists and have our computers learn from these. We can only get such note precise information from special instruments such as this computer grand piano, which measures and precisely measures and stores every movement when you play, every key and pedal movement, so that from that information we can reconstruct every detail of a performance. But um, of, of course, and unfortunately, the, the great pianists like a Rubinstein or Brendel never did play and record on such an instrument. Except um, the pianist that we heard at the beginning with a few bars of Chopin was a famous artist of the 20th century, the Russian pianist uh, Nikita Magalov. And in the course of our work, we stumbled upon an amazing story. Magalov had indeed played Chopin on such a computer grand piano on the Bösendorfer SE. And not just one piece, but the entire solo piano works by Chopin. And he did this live in a series of live concerts in Vienna in the 1980s, shortly before his death. And I discovered this data by chance in the Bösendorfer Piano Factory. And then I managed to obtain the permission by his widow, Madame Irene Magalov, to use this data for scientific research. And we're talking more than 300,000 played notes here. And in order to quantify every detail of these, we had to first align these to the score. That is, we needed to identify for each pl played note the corresponding note in the printed scores and link them so we could calculate all relevant properties of every note, including, by the way, all the mistakes that Magalov made. There's actually one hidden in there if you look closely. Anyway, this took us something like two years, but the result is the complete Chopin played by a famous pianist re measured note by note in every conceivable detail. Um, and that's a fantastic data source, and it's a op unique opportunity to look into the art of a great pianist. And it is fantastic training material for our computers. So now we have not just one, but hundreds of pieces and performances to learn from. And I will spare you the details of machine learning here, except to say that this is obviously a difficult learning task with complex data and lots of open questions regarding how to encode music, how to set up learning algorithms, how to evaluate the results. 
And over the years, we've run hundreds of experiments and obtained hundreds of models with different properties. And we made some interesting discoveries along the way. But uh, I suppose what you want to know is how good does it get? Can a machine really learn to play music musically just by analyzing a lot of data? Let me show you one example to give you an impression of just how good it can get. This is really one of the best results we ever got. This is the Nocturne from before, but now played by the computer after it has learned from other pieces. Uh, and let me just play an audio recording quickly, and please listen to the tempo, the timing, how naturally it flows. The red lines below show the inverse of tempo. So that was much nicer than we, what we heard earlier, wasn't it? It's beginning to sound like real music. And indeed, um, colleagues of ours from Italy and Australia also showed in a, in a blind test experiment, a so-called Turing test, with a large number of human listeners, that our computer actually managed to fool people into believing it was a human pianist playing, with a higher humanness rating than even a real pianist. <laughs> which is, I don't know what to make of that. And I think, we should, at this point, we should take a step back and. For one thing, this was a very limited experiment with only one sing simple piece. And generally, I think this is rather misleading. So yes, computers may be able to produce performances sometimes, that may fool humans sometimes. But in the end, it's not about fooling people, is it? It's about art, it's about expressive communication. And um, as an AI scientist, which is what I am, I want to be very clear about this here. We're not tearing down any walls or fundamental barriers between humans and machines here. There are fundamental differences between a human and a machine. And in the context of the arts, the impo most important one to me is a machine has nothing to say. It has no urge to express or communicate anything. It has no life of its own out of which it would draw mm -hmm. profound insights. So machines can learn to imitate and simulate, but artistic expression requires humans if it is to be in any way profound, and I'm deeply convinced of that. But that doesn't mean that computers cannot be useful also in the context of the arts, uh, for example, as assistants, to permit you to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. And it's in this spirit that I would like to, to turn to the end point of our presentation here, our a companion. The a companion is a computer program that a computer that accompanies and plays together with a human pianist in an expressive, or let's call it, it co-expressive way. For example, when you need someone to practice music for two pianists, and it shouldn't just play its part in the strict way so that the human would have to adapt to it, but it should be the other way around that the machine listens and recognizes and adapts to your playing so that we get a natural musical cooperation. Well, uh, and this is now going to be kind of a world premiere, the first ever live demonstration of our, our companion. And since I wouldn't have the nerve or, and skill to do this, I asked my colleague Carlos Cancino to play for you. Carlos is the mastermind behind the companion. And he's also a fantastic pianist. And while he's getting ready, let me just remind you of what uh, this computer has, the computer accompanist has to be able to, capable of doing. So at the heart of it is a learned computational performance model. But it also has to sort of listen to the pianist and try to follow and synchronize itself with him. It needs to recognize the pianist's expressive intentions, his, the way he wants to play and adapt its own playing to that. And the hardest part, it constantly needs to anticipate and predict the human's actions, because reacting would always be too late. So its entire playing must be based on predictions 
all the time. But uh, in the best case, and if everything works well now, you shouldn't hear any of that. You should just hear music and a vivid human machine code performance. Carlos, it's yours. Would you like to have an encore? So, can we have one? Can, can, can we have an encore? This is, this is difficult, this is complex technology and it takes a, lot, a long time to set up. No, we, we don't have any piece ready, I'm afraid. Can't you switch off the computer and he plays? That we can do. <laughs> now Wonderful. The, um, well, no, I would, I, <laughs> you'd have to ask him, not sure. me. Sure. No, he's not prepared. Would, would you play uh, for us once again without <laughs> a computer? But not this piece. Yeah. Uh, what, what? Wonderful. Has he in the, can you play any, any nice piece for us? Uh, he can, I'm sure he can. 